Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And um, thank you, um, John, for your kind words of introduction. Uh, if you give a lawyer a title like, if I rule the world, <laughs> uh, you have to appreciate that you're in for a, a, a legalistic uh, discourse um, of a highly repulsive nature. Uh, so, um, here we go. Um, I've been told half an hour or the next course will be completely spoiled. Um, so, I shall try to be um, attentive to the clock. Um, I start with a proposition which may or may not be um, controversial or controversy, uh, but it is uh, that almost any social institution, uh, whether it be a family or a school or a college or a community or a professional company or a state, uh, needs some sort of rules as to how it organizes itself, however uh, informal or uh, relaxed, as in a family, for example, uh, those rules may be. Uh, and the reason for this um, is really pretty obvious. Uh, I may have a burning desire uh, to assault my next door neighbor. Uh, I may want to build uh, something of my own desire absolutely wherever I like. Uh, on any land that I may happen to owe, and I may choose to conduct my life uh, without regard to the interests of anyone else at all. But, of course, I know that if I can assault my next-door neighbour with impunity, he can exercise the same indulgence uh, uh, with regard to me, uh, and if I can um, build wherever I like, then somebody else can build uh, something which will destroy the view, um, reduce the amenity, and um, as Ruskin rather beautifully put it, a single villa may bar a landscape and dethrone a dynasty of hills. And equally, if I can live my life without regard for the interests of anybody else, so of course they can live their lives without regard for my interests at all. So the truth, I suggest, is uh, that we are all more or less willing to accept the measure of restraint on our own activities as the price which we pay for a restraint similarly exercised by others. So, uh, we accept the need for legal rules. Most of the time, of course, they don't have to be enforced uh, because we all know what the rules are, we all comply with them, we all see the the sense of them, but they are enforceable in the last resort by courts or uh, tribunals. Uh, nothing very controversial, probably, so far. But I'm viewing it all in a national context uh, within the confines of a particular nation state. Uh, and perhaps it's helpful just to ask a rather basic question as to you know, what the functions of the state are. Well, to begin with, we'd all uh, have said, going back centuries, we'd have said that the functions of the state are defense. The state clearly has a, a responsibility to defend us all from our enemies. Uh, it has some sort of responsibility to maintain public order and tranquility, or what is uh, rather, I think, attractively known as the king's or the queen's peace. And then there's the question of, of taxation and public finance, uh, a long-standing uh, function of the state. But over time, of course, the functions of the state expanded. Uh, we found ourselves moving a great empire. We uh, found a need quite early on to make provision for the relief of poverty of the poor uh, and, and more modern times, um, old age pensions, that sort of thing, matter of particular interest to me nowadays, um, we uh, recognize that the state has a function in regards to the regulation of trade, the control of development and planning, the protection of health and safety, responsibility for education, 
It's accepted a responsibility in relation to matters of employment, etc., etc. But it has become, as I would suggest, increasingly clear that there are very many problems which individual nations are simply incompetent to address on their own. Historically, uh, in matters of defence, we were able to rely with great confidence on the Royal Navy. But now that nobody would suggest for an instant uh, that we were able to defend ourselves against any major foe, we're dependent on the United States, we're dependent on uh, NATO to defend ourselves against any serious attack. We couldn't do it on our own. Uh, the same is true of most powers in the world, except perhaps the United States and China. And even the United States, after all, suffered a <coughs> crippling loss of its fleet at Pearl Harbor in 1941 and um, the much publicized attack on the Twin Towers in 2001. Hence, of course, the growth of military alliances around the world, recognition uh, that you need help from other people if you are going to tackle these sort of problems. The same, as I would uh, suggest, is very obviously true of crime. Uh, of, there are some crimes, of course, of a purely uh, domestic nature. You can't rape somebody uh, unless you're actually there at the time. Uh, nor can you burgle their house. Uh, but modern methods of communication uh, do make it possible uh, to commit a crime in one country that has very severe results in another. Uh, fraud is an obvious example of that. Uh, terrorism is another. Drugs uh, are another. Uh, and uh, one of the great growth areas in the criminal field as trans-border uh, crime of that kind. The same uh, is obviously true, uh, as I would suggest, in matters of taxation and public finance. This is no longer purely uh, a national matter. Uh, we've had a good deal of attention uh, in the recent weeks to the tendency of uh, some of our fellow citizens, corporate and individual, to squirrel funds offshore in various tax havens, um, the recommendation of which is the lack of transparency uh, in their procedures. The current financial breakdown makes it absolutely plain how interdependent all our economies are uh, with the result that um, uh, the subprime crisis in the United States uh, results in millions of people being put out of work all over the world. Uh, this is, of course, not a new problem. It's a problem um, that was tackled at Bretton Woods in 1944. It's a great international conference. Uh, but the solutions then reached uh, have broken down and no longer offer adequate protection. One result of the end of empire is uh, that we now have to achieve by negotiation and agreement what we could once um, achieve by imperial diktat, although we didn't call it that. Uh, the regulation of trade is a very obvious example. Let me take a simple illustration. Suppose goods are loaded on a vessel in a port in one country, and the vessel goes to an intermediate port where it unloads some of the goods but not these, and then it goes on to its destination port where it discharges uh, the cargo. It would be completely and utterly absurd to have different laws governing the loading of the cargo in the first port, or the port and any transshipment that might be in the intermediate port, and the discharge at the third port. And the only sensible thing is to have a common code of rules that everybody signs up to, and that govern the whole transaction from the loading of the goods at the beginning to their discharge at the end. 
Uh, and that has, of course, been achieved by international convention. Uh, the Hague Rules has sort of updated that um, a, a large number of maritime nations observe. And there are similar provisions governing carriage by air, uh, uh, carriage by road, uh, and of course, GATT and answer travel. The same is all true, as I would suggest, um, of health and safety. Uh, some of these things can be safely dealt with within national boundaries. Uh, but then one uh, gets quite a, a lot of uh, conditions which are extremely dangerous and which don't respect national boundaries, like AIDS or uh, avian flu. <coughs> And we're all legitimately concerned uh, about the safety uh, of the products that we eat and drink and use and wear, uh, which may very well not uh, have been produced in uh, the United Kingdom. Same, to some extent, is true of education. We can lay down a national syllabus, but in the age of the internet, uh, it is uh, very, very hard uh, to exert uh, any uh, monitoring influence on what reaches the minds of the young. Employment. We want uh, people to be free to come and work here uh, when we need them. But of course the price of that is that we make it possible for people here to go and work somewhere else uh, if they need them. Uh, and that gives rise to a need for commonly agreed standards of treatment um, and commonly agreed standards of employment procedure. So far, uh, in the course of this extremely cursory survey, um, I've omitted what I would suggest are two very important areas of activity. The first, uh, the environment. Much as we might like uh, the contrary to be said, uh, the agents of pollution don't respect national boundaries. Uh, the cutting down of the Amazonian rainforest affects us all, not uh, simply a matter for uh, Brazil. Pollution of the atmosphere in the United States or China or India or anywhere else affects us all. It's not just a matter for them. The second important matter that I've so far said nothing at all about is war. Historically a matter for decision by individual nations. And the covenant of the League of Nations, interestingly, didn't prohibit war uh, as a final resort. It discouraged it but didn't prohibit it. Uh, but it was prohibited by a pact in 1928. Uh, that, uh, however, did not prevent the Japanese invading Manchuria, did not prevent the Italians invading Abyssinia, did not prevent the Russians invading Finland, did not prevent the Germans invading Western Europe, and did not prevent the Japanese invading a great deal of Southeast Asia. So, the United Nations Charter was adopted. I think 192 nations are now party to it. Uh, and it laid down in very clear terms uh, that war, the resort to force, uh, was legitimate in self-defense or if authorized by the Security Council under Chapter 7 of the Charter. There's an argument which I'm not going to get into uh, about whether the resort to force is legitimate to prevent an overwhelming uh, humanitarian catastrophe. But there have, of course, been many wars. Uh, and if one takes the war in Iraq as an example, uh, nobody plausibly suggests that it was self-defense. And nobody suggests, I think, um, that um, it, Iraq was evaded to prevent an overwhelming human humanitarian catastrophe. And the question, which is a matter of controversy, 
uh, is where it was authorized by the Security Council. So, what I would suggest uh, is that the need for enforceable legal rules is as great on the international plane as it is on the national, and perhaps, very arguably, much more so, because the consequences of having no rules or not observing them are potentially so much more dire. So, um, if I rule the world, uh, I would seek to address uh, what um, I see as the major weaknesses in uh, the international protection of the sort of rights that I've been discussing. And I, I should mention three uh, weaknesses. First, hugely important areas of international life uh, are not regulated by international agreement in any meaningful sense at the moment. Uh, I would give uh, climate change as one example of that, um, and I would give the, the regulation of international uh, finance uh, and international financial institutions as another. These are gaps uh, which I would suggest uh, need to be filled not for the sake of regulation uh, for its own sake, but because uh, regulation uh, would improve the lot of mankind. The second weakness um, that I would seek to address if I ruled the world, uh, the second weakness is that the United Nations is frequently unable to take effective action. Why is that? One reason, I think, um, is that it has no soldiers. It has no force at its command. I think it's clear from the language of the Charter that those who drafted it contemplated that it would have, that the member states of the United Nations would make uh, force available to it, who would then become United Nations forces, uh, available to act on its behalf. As it is, uh, the United Nations is dependent on uh, member states being willing, in effect, to lend forces uh, to it to carry out its missions. Uh, and they can't be forced to do so. And there's no sort of quota saying, you know, it's high time you provided 20,000 men to your turn. Uh, so it's all extremely uh, voluntary. Uh, and the second weakness is, um, I think, um, that action by the Security Council is liable to be vetoed by one of the permanent members of the Security Council who have a veto. Now this is a very, very fraught and difficult area, um, and even endowed with the power to rule the world, um, I'm not going to suggest <laughs> that there's any very obvious or easy solution. Uh, because uh, I think the historical record makes it clear uh, that the existence of the veto was the price of obtaining agreement to the Charter. Uh, and I don't uh, think uh, that even if, let us say, the United Kingdom and France were willing to abandon their veto, it would be very easy to imagine the United States or Russia or China doing so. On the other hand, I find it very hard to see how real progress uh, could be made uh, without some mechanism for overriding or bypassing uh, the veto of those who, at the end of the Second War, were on, as it were, the right side of the counter. Uh, perhaps this could be solved by 
some formula involving an enhanced majority of the Security Council. Uh, but um, uh, a solution, I think, is um, eminently desirable. The third weakness to which I would draw attention and which, if I ruled the world, I would seek to address uh, is uh, the lack of effective compulsory enforcement of international agreements, even when they've been entered into, even when they're accepting, accepted to be binding in international law, and even where it's pretty clear they've been violated. Uh, it is, as I would suggest to you all, uh, important that international rules, just like national rules, uh, should be, in the last resort, enforceable. The problem is uh, that the jurisdiction of the prime instrument of international justice, namely the International Court of Justice in The Hague, which I think ranks as the senior body of the United Nations, its jurisdiction depends on consent. Uh, if you don't want to submit to the jurisdiction of the court, you don't have to. And some major powers uh, don't, notably, currently, the United States. Now, this is, of course, a marked contrast if uh, you or I is in, are indicted in the Cambridge Crown Court uh, for mm -hmm. um, some motoring offence or even some more dark offence wholly unbefitting a Rotary. <laughs> <laughs> um, we don't have much of a choice as to whether we consent to the jurisdiction uh, of the Cambridge Crown Court, uh, nor do we if uh, for reason, good or bad, somebody sues us in the Cambridge County Court. We either defend the action or it goes by default. The one thing we cannot be heard uh, to say is this action can't go ahead because I don't uh, consent. So it's not uh, anyway enough, even if you can get a binding judgment, uh, unless you have some means of enforcing it, and if, if all else fails, imposing effective sanctions. None of this is at all easy. Uh, and so, uh, even though I rule the world, um, and am like Gordon Brown, the master of the universe, <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't offer any quick fixes, uh, but I hope at least I've given you all enough to disagree with. <laughs> <laughs>